Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here on this edition of the REI Hacker Podcast. Uh, I'm excited about my next guest. He's actually a longtime friend. Troy and I have known each other for years. He is the leader of i the investment community of the Rockies. Uh, Troy's been in the industry all his life. Uh, he grew up with his father being a general contractor, and his mom was a property manager, so he has that in his blood. And I get to spend some time with him today. I'm so glad you had the opportunity uh, to spend some time with us, Troy. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I, I would say I'm not sure that I had it in my blood. Uh, I remember working for my dad, laying hardwood. Uh, he, he was very particular about what he did. And so now when I work with contractors, my expectations are really, really high. <laughs> but at the same time, my mom being a property manager, uh, I realized really quickly that I did not want to be the property manager. I wanted to be the investor that she was working for. <laughs> so yes and no. Yes and no. But that's the good thing about growing up in that is you get a little taste of it and you don't have to go down the same path that your parents went. Yeah. Um, but if you have a chance of getting a really good look at it, then you've got a better idea than most of choosing like a career path. Because a lot of us, we decide what we want to do in college. And we learn basically based off of like what our interests are. We take classes here and there and it's all for theory, right? It's not the real like on the job training that you would get if you went and did it. So you, you were fortunate enough to get OJT at an early age. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I, I jokingly said, I was like, I, I started off in the art sector, the not-for-profit world. And I never thought that I would own a home. Uh, I'm not even sure I thought I was going to pay off my student loans, but uh, somehow, some way, I managed to make my way to the real estate world. Um, and having put on several events and sitting at the back of the room, I feel like I'm a proxy invex investor that I was just sitting in the back of the room long enough to listen long enough to say, I really should do something with all this information that I've just obtained by being close to these people. And I've, I've met some amazing people that I think I'm drawn to that entrepreneurial lifestyle. Oh yeah, it is. It's inspirational, right? And they always tell you to like get in the same room as people you want to be like. So you like, you basically just built your own room. Like, all right, <laughs> this is the room. I'm going to invite all the cool people to come hang out there. And then I'll get, I'll get to hang out with them and, and kind of glean some of their experience and learn some strategy and, you know, I'll actually put some deals together too. That's all, one of the biggest reasons why a lot of people start real estate investment clubs or associations is because they want access to deal flow. Yeah. Um, it, that's, it's, it's amazing the things that come through my email or the, the voicemail messages that are left on the i uh, uh, mailbox. Just, I, I, I have a lot of off market deals that come through there and I'm always like, does this make sense for me? Do I know a member that's uh, actively doing this type of deal? Can I send it to them? Um, and so it's, it has been that for me. Well, if you come across anything in Jefferson County with some land, <laughs> think about me. Okay. So I want something with a couple of acres plus maybe some water. I know that's a big ask. Um, but you know, I've been thinking about, you know, that part of the country as a place for me to like buy a forever home. So if you see anything over there, let me know. I don't know if it was in Jefferson County. It may be on the border uh, here in Denver by Sloan's Lake. I have a duplex. Uh, an investor is about to get about to get foreclosed on, um, and so oh, no. I'm trying to figure out what they need to do. Uh, it's been on the market for 45 days, and I'm trying to help them through that. Uh, you know, and if it gets worst case scenario, it's like, you know, we can go through a short sale, even though I think a lot of people are sleeping on that, that strategy that it may be dead and gone with the, uh, great recession. But I think after say, I don't know, 21, when interest rates skyrocketed, people don't have nearly as much equity in the properties and they're maybe over leveraged. So, yeah. uh, yeah, maybe I'll have a deal for you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, Sloan's Lake isn't, maybe there's some land there. I don't know. But if, if there was more than two acres there, that would be a really expensive piece of property. Um, but I'm not saying no. Um, <laughs> but this highlights exactly what this group can do for you and for others who want to be part of ARIA. So tell me what, what ARIA is. ARIA. Um, 
a real estate investors association. Um, and to my knowledge, uh, the the RIAs came from the old uh, traveling gurus from the 70s and 80s that had all of these students all over the country. And once these students started to do deals, they wanted to talk to other people. And so all of these students needed a place to sort of gather. And so it became a place where you had, you got your deal flow because we didn't have the internet back then and you had to find your contractors. And so it was all word of mouth and it was all happening in that, for lack of a better term, a watering hole that everybody sort of gathered at or a base camp that people were sharing information, insight and, and deals. So 70s and 80s, people started to get together and it, it, the traveling gurus, right? There's the guys that I think of like Carlton Sheets, uh, Robert Allen. I mean, maybe even probably before them because they were probably more popular in the, like, the late 80s, early 90s. Um, Jack Miller, I think, is one of the mm. big uh, gurus. Robert Allen is definitely in there. Um, gosh, I can't remember. I, I, yeah, there's a whole list of them, but I, God love them. Most of them are dead at this point. <laughs> Well, maybe some of them are, um, but I'm actually no Robert. I met him at the family mastermind. Okay. Um, he's in that. And, um, you know, there's a handful of, of people that are still, you know, from that era that are still in, in the community and still doing things. I mean, they've got a wealth of knowledge to share. And that's what's so cool about Aria is it's a, it's a safe place for people to go and educate themselves and get multiple pieces of value. It's not just a book you're reading by yourself, you know, a couple pages here and there. You actually get to go someplace, uh, at least in the olden days, right? But <laughs> pre-COVID. Um, and then you get to shake hands with people who are potentially your millionaires. And yeah. you get to shake their hand, you get to learn their, you know, what their strategy is, their experiences. They, they, you know, also give back to the community. And then you would have speakers come in and teach on certain subjects, certain investment strategies. Um, and then, you know, you, have, you gave people the opportunity to buy things too, right? Like I remember one time I went to one of your clubs and there was this guy there that came through just from some other place and and he had a course and I was like, oh, I want to learn that, right? And so I got a chance to to get it like from a third party, right? That third party referral, which I think is important because there's so many charlatans out there that, that are selling things that you don't know if it's real or not, but you're kind of like a filtering mechanism for people to, because you do your due diligence before you let people come in that door. Yeah. And I, I often tell people, um, you know, not all RIAs are created equal. And just like anything that you're going to do in this industry is you need to do, do your due diligence and find out if that the group and the leaders resonate with what you are going in the same direction. Um, otherwise, you might get yourself in a position where maybe they haven't done the due diligence. But for me, um, yeah, I, there are tons of offers of people coming through that that want to speak at i uh, But for me, I always sort of nail it down to two things. Either what what is the market yielding or what does the market dictate that we need to learn about? Or what does the membership want to learn about? And so the first one is my primary focus. And the second one is just sort of based upon um, people that are, are wanting to get education to ramp up. And that was one of the reasons that i got started was all of these investors up in northern Colorado were all around the same level. And so they were like, well, let's all just go through this together. And now there's some of the most successful investors I know in Colorado. Um, and there's nothing wrong with investing in an education. Um, in fact, I, I, there's tons of free out there, but we all know the value of free and we don't really value it at all. Mm -hmm. But once we invest time, energy and resources into something, it becomes a little bit more uh, focused and a little, you become a little bit more driven. Um, and there are some great educators out there and there are some not so great educators out there. But uh, again, it's it's understanding yourself and then finding, you know, how you learn as a, as a human, I don't think that we always factor that in is like, are we a visual learner, auditory, kinesthetic, or hands-on, um, understanding yourself and the best educator for you, uh, 
and then you choose your investing strategy uh, and the expert in that area. Right. And I got to think too, it's a very interesting balance that you have to maintain because you have to tiptoe the line of providing tons of value to the group, your members, and then these people coming through who are willing to pay you to get in front of others, right? They'll either write you a check or they'll do some sort of a rev split, but you're running a business. Mm -hmm. So you have to balance running a business where the goal is to make money, you know, or, or, or break even, right? Because in some of these, you're, they're nonprofits, right? And, and, but then they, they're there to, to succeed, but they need to have revenue to pay for bills. You've got costs. You have to, you have to pay for locations and you have to pay for staff. And there's all these, these bills that come through. So how do you balance the idea that it, it is a business, but it also is there to, to take care of people. It's that, that word association is at the end, right? And that lends to, okay, we're in a safe place where we're not going to get taken. How do you, how do you balance that? Well, I mean, it goes back to uh, the National Real Estate Investors Association, which is our parent association, um, and their their motto is to promote, protect, and serve the industry. First and foremost is that it is our job to sort of protect our ability as real estate entrepreneurs to practice and to sort of protect our interests out there from an advocacy and governmental affairs standpoint, but Yes, there there are people out there that simply will, will will get the best selling speaker, but I've always found that the best spelling selling speaker is not always the best speaker. There are some people that just give and give and give and give, and uh, they're not always the best. But at the same time, I have to feel good about who I'm putting up up on the stage, because I we used to say in the office, uh, you know, what's best for the investor. And that has always served us as a business. And I, I don't think that that's true. Again, not all RIAs are created equal. But if you go into it with that in mind, I think it's going to serve. And I, maybe that's a little too holistic or altruistic, but it has served. And I think that i has an integrity uh, out there in the, the community as, as that for the community. And yeah. it might not be as important to some people. And that's fine. They're you're just not my people if that's the case. Right. It's and that's business in general, right? There yeah, are a lot of go-givers out there, and there's people that are willing to just give more than they take. And again, it's a balance in in, in all of those. And it, you brought up the National Association. Um, how how does that relationship work where you're you're like a local chapter, right? And so there's some sort of like governing documents that says how you have to run your organization because you're part of the national association of real estate so what is it national real estate investors association association thank you so because you're part of that group right you get elevated right as an organization that does put their members first and is there to protect along with the other things um so how does that relationship work well I, one, I think the word RIA is thrown around way too much. First and foremost, there there are RIAs and then there are clubs. There are a lot of real estate investor clubs out there. And in my mind, a club is for a hobbyist, somebody that you know is interested in learning about something. Whereas an association, and it's not just related to real estate, real estate investing. There are associations for anything. You know, I I've gone to professional organizations uh, training where there is the National uh, Christmas Tree Association. And it's for people that, you know, have Christmas tree farms and sell to the consumers. And so uh, the National Association is an umbrella to all of those associations out there that maybe were, you know, practicing by themselves. And then they came in underneath that umbrella. And so as a national organization, we go from say, i has 500 members. And National RIA has, uh, depending upon the day, 60 to 70,000 members nationwide. And so we suddenly get buying power or we get uh, bargaining power. And so we pull all of our resources together so that we're not splintered. And everyone who's trying to accomplish the same thing suddenly has one universal voice. 
And I think our, our national, national association uh, has been around for 26 or 27 years at this point. And all of those little groups that I mentioned to you earlier came in underneath of that national organization. And they started to develop that advocacy and governmental affairs at the national level. And I'd say in about 08, 09, right around when Dodd-Frank came into play is when National really stepped up and started having a, a seat at the table and a voice so that when our elected officials were making policy and legislation, that they could make informed decisions about you know what it is that we do and how it will impact our livelihood. Because I, I think as a real estate entrepreneur, there are larger commercial developers and investors, and we're sort of small mom and pop operators. And I think our stories get leveraged on their behalf, say for the apart multifamily community or any number of lending institutions out there. And so the National Association provides a lot of insight, resources, uh, discounts, rebates, everything to the local association so they can pass it on. Um, and so a lot of the communication that happens at the national level comes to us, and then we have to get it out to our membership as well. Um, and so in a lot of ways, the way that the national organization operates for us, we operate that way for our members. Mm. So what are like these, these policies that you have to abide by? Can you give us a sense of what the rules are? Like if you want to be part of the national association versus just a club, what are like these, these rules you have to abide by? We have to be constantly be in touch with our membership, communicating in some capacity, uh, whether that is a monthly meeting, whether that is a webinar, um, we have the have to have the ability to quickly and efficiently communicate any policy changes or advocacy or governmental affairs, like we call it like the bat line. And so we have, we have to be able to send that out to all of our membership rather easily. Um, and I mentioned some of the the relationships that they have developed. And I think probably the, the most well known is the relationship with the Home Depot um, because of our buying power you know, 60 to 70,000 real estate investors, I believe that we are, as a national organization, Home Depot's largest uh, national account and roughly $2 billion in spend. And so that gets people's attention. Uh, it gives us the ability to, to negotiate uh, deeper discounts through those relationships. Uh, but we have to sort of honor those relationships that they are developing on our behalf. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I literally have to spend one day a year going through the entire compliance process, saying that I filed my taxes, that I am on, running on the up and up, I'm good with the Secretary of State, and it's literally making sure that they're doing their due diligence on us, that we're operating and providing the best uh, professional organization that we can be. Yeah, I think it's it's a great concept. I think that there should be more organizations that run like that. Um, because there's how many how many chapters are there now? Uh, hundred and twenty. So there's probably at least four or five times that many. Oh yeah, clubs, right? Well, here I, in Colorado, I, I mean, there <laughs> there's, yeah. there's easily seven, eight, nine, ten. I don't know, and here in Denver. Um, and however many in Colorado Springs and however many up north. Um, and that's where I go back to the difference between a club and an association. Uh, I think a lot of the people that are running those groups aren't necessarily interested in making sure that they do those things. I sure hope so, because mm -hmm. um, I can guarantee you that the government does not consider what we do to be a hobby. <laughs> right. No, they sh they sure do not. Um, but you mentioned something interesting there about... Um, the you know having a seat at the table mm -hmm. right and being able to be part of conversation where they're talking policy what are some of the important things that national has been able to be a part of that you think was positive where there was a positive outcome or maybe something that didn't work well i mean let's go back to dodd frank uh seller financing was under heavy scrutiny there for a while 
uh, but it was because of the predatory practices of some of the larger national banks. And they weren't, you know, everything in terms of <laughs> policy is always good in theory, but poor in execution, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you know how legislation works, sometimes it's sort of quid pro quo, where you're putting up a piece of policy and they slide something in there from somebody else that has nothing to do with. And so Dodd-Frank was literally the kitchen sink. Everything was in there. And I can't even remember some of the most oddball stuff that was in there. But through National RIA's participation with the Seller Finance Coalition, uh, they were able to pull out uh, the, the mom and pop operators to expand our ability to practice seller financing a little bit more freer, a little bit more nimbly. That's a great example. Yeah. I mean, we, you and I were just talking about that recently. Um, you know, and you, you got another, um, I don't know if it was another meeting coming up, you've been getting a lot of calls about seller financing in sub two. And, and so there's a right and a wrong way to do it. Um, That's and that, that that's a conversation that we're we're having now at the national level. Uh, there are a lot of legal professionals who participate in those conversations. And when something is done at a high enough volume, it starts to get the attention. and and how policies change, specifically on the state and local level is they hear about it from another city that has passed it and they're like, oh, we think that's a great idea. We should implement it here. And so in the same way that we as real estate investors are sharing information, so are your local municipalities and things. And so when something is done wrong over and over and over again and has an adverse effect, it has its way of going all the way to the top and ultimately changing the whole landscape of the industry. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly can. Um, so national is, is working on a bunch of different things. I'm sure at all different points, like what's something that national is working on right now, maybe it has to do with policy or legislation that you think is going to be important for real estate investors and, and the communities to know about. I think overall, uh, affordable housing is not something just isolated here to Colorado. It's happening across the country. Um, and I think when I was talking about this earlier is that, you know, a lot of the bigger multifamily operators, they've 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 become like the airlines and they have all of these ridiculous fees that are just being thrown in there. I think the most absurd thing that I heard was I have to pay a fee to get on a waiting list just to apply to get into this community. And so it's been my experience. The apartment associations around the country have what are called the independent rental owner councils. And those are smaller operators from their standpoint, but larger operators from ours. And we have, I think I said it earlier, it's like we have a better story. You know, these are people using their livelihoods to invest in providing housing. And it's a lot easier for us to lose everything, whereas the multifamily players are just making all of these changes and it's impacting us downstream. And so the, the National Association has been working with the National Apartment Association and also talking uh, to some legislators uh, on the Hill as well about how do we sort of navigate this. Um, at i we're participating with the Colorado Landlord Legislative Coalition. Um, and the most interesting thing that I heard when we were giving testimony uh, to representatives, uh, it was a landlord in Boulder. And this was right after the pandemic. And uh, he stopped the questioning and said, with all due respect, do you know what the cost of a two by four is? And the respective representative had said, I don't see how that has anything to do with what we're talking about. And so it's it's literally developing those relationships. And I think before we sort of tell them what's right and wrong, I think we have to present ourselves to policymakers and say, look, we're in this day in and day out. We can give you insight. We can give you information. We can be here for you as a uh, sounding board for some of the things that you're trying to implement. Again, going back to policy is always good in theory, but horrible in execution. Right. And I would argue too, I don't know if it's always good in theory because there are some <laughs> shitty policy um, 
proposals out there, right? Um, so yeah, I think each side, because a lot of policy is you know a dichotomy, right? Um, believes that it's in the best interest of their constituents and for the majority of the population, but oftentimes those policies contradict each other, right? From the from two opposite oh, um, sort of groups, right? So. Yeah, that's probably a discussion for another day. Yes. <laughs> um, but it does affect everything that we do. Like, you know, you say when you're creating policy, there's going to be two different perspectives on that, depending upon which side of the aisle you're talking to. And I mean, you just look at like, you know, these, one of the biggest things I think about is, is like landlord friendly states, right? Or or vice versa, right? And so there's like a lot of people who say, just don't invest in blue states if you're a landlord, because- there's there's policies there that just don't support what the landlord is trying to do, which is is to have a profitable business, have cash flow. So you know the squatters' rights, and you know during COVID there was that whole thing where okay you didn't have to pay your rent, right? But the the landlord had to pay their mortgage, and I don't know how that's good for anybody because it caused this huge you know backlog of of mortgages that were delinquent and uh, you know redoing their mortgages and the cares act and all that stuff that all trickle down right Every you said like you said everything starts at the top and trickles down i i would say um it's easy to get all doom and gloom about the things that are happening but there's still so much opportunity out there mm. and if you are a smart investor you're going to invest in what the market is yielding and so how do you pivot? So, you know, we talked about affordable housing and how do you provide that? You know, I had a friend, a colleague who had said, this was even before the pandemic. He said, all, all it's going to take is one black swan event and all of that housing inventory that's sitting on Airbnb is going to come flooding the market and just crash everything. And we thought that when the pandemic happened, that was going to happen. And it was the total opposite but now, I mean, you're starting to see a, a crunch in housing inventory, specifically affordable housing. And, you know, what are things that you can do right now? Maybe it's shifting to uh, shared housing or co-living. And then you can diversify the way that the multifamily community is with their properties with a single family house and still get the the margins that you had with your mid or short-term rental. You know, just what are ways that we can think creatively, again, by what the market is giving us and where opportunity uh, presents itself? Yeah, you're right about, I was thinking co-living right before you said it as one of those potential solutions for, you know, the, the rising costs of housing. Um, Pad Split is now moving to Denver. You probably heard about that. Um, Pat Split is just, you know, a, a property manager, a marketer for co-living, the co-living strategy. I've um, actually been talking to them for about a year. <laughs> have you? Yeah, I. Uh, because of that very reason, um, my, again, because we're affiliated with the National Association, we have colleagues in other cities that we can tap into. And I'm very close with uh, my colleague down in Phoenix at the Arizona Real Estate Investors Association, and he's been working with them pretty closely. And again, thinking about what is currently happening in the market here in Colorado, it, it, it seems like a perfect fit. Yeah. And then legislation was just passed at a high level to allow for more unrelated individuals to live in the same house, which is just moving that further down the line as far as you know, allowing for that co-living strategy to work. And, and a, a juxtaposition to this is ADUs. So last week I had a meeting with the city and county of Denver's planning and development. And since the mayor has relaxed all zoning for ADUs across the city, there's still two stipulations that do, doesn't allow investors to sort of play in that space. Uh, one is you have to be owner occupied to have the ADU or two, if it is a new construction, you can build the ADU on the property. And so my question is to them, to the city, is how can we provide affordable housing with uh, ADUs on existing parcels? Maybe there's land, you know, you need an X amount of square footage to build an ADU in the first place. If that exists on a rental property, why not be able to put that on there? 
But then again, unintended consequences is how do you tax that? Or, you know, what are property tax? Is it two dwellings? Is it one? You know, th those are the questions that now they're asking us. Is that the big argument there is how do you tax it? Because it seems it's to me that you tax it the same way as you would someone who has, who owns a property and is an owner occupant, right? There's a, there's a, a solution there. I feel like there's something else there besides the, the taxing of it because who, why would a homeowner go and just build an ADU? Well, I, no reason, I unless they're going to make money. It's probably so not the policymakers. It's mm -hmm. the, the NIMBY people that want to protect yeah. their property values. They want to protect their neighborhoods. They don't want these things there. So NIMBY for everybody is not in my backyard. Yeah. Right? So they don't want a bunch of extra cars on the street. They don't want extra people walking around and disrupting the way that they've lived in their house for the last 30 years. Right. And I think initially, at least here in Denver, uh, one of the pushbacks on ADUs was that people thought that they were going or policymakers thought that people were going to run their businesses out of those ADUs in the backyard. And so a residential area then becomes a um, commercial area. And, you know, how do you sort of play that? But it, I don't know how many people were running their businesses out of their ADUs. Well, they're going to do it out of their one of the bedrooms or their basement. You, right. The same way. So why not let it be a separate building? I don't know. The, the, the arguments just don't hold up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so affordable housing is something that's on your radar. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been, you know, it's been on there for a while and we're, it's, we're one of many cities where affordable housing is a big issue. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, the migrant crisis, right? Just new people coming to all these different states where we got to figure out where to where to put these people um, and not have them on the streets. And so affordable housing is a big part of it, but also inflation, um, you know, obviously interest rates. So like a lot of people can't go buy right now, but rents have gone up so much too, where just the average person who needs to go rent a house for their family can't afford it. It's one of those, I mean, I, I, I geek out on planning and development. I, I, I love watching migration patterns inward and outward. Um, I mean, there was a period of time when Denver or Colorado specifically was sort of a oil and gas state, but they have done a tremendous job of diversifying their workforce. However, comma, <laughs> their, their workforce has a tendency to be white collar, uh, which brings in, you know, higher educated people with more disposable income. Uh, but I think the thing that we forget is, you know, there's a workforce that has to support that community as well. And we've got to figure out what that balance looks like. And uh, I, I don't, I don't know that I necessarily know the solution to it, but I mean, everybody has a seat at the table here. Right. Now, earlier you mentioned you know, one of the greatest accomplishments for the National RIA was securing that that Home Depot account. You glossed over it, but you were a big part of that, weren't you? Uh <laughs> you you were at the National Association. Yes. I so I and that's sort of how I got into real estate investing and running a RIA is that uh I initially started off with the Cincinnati Apartment Association and uh, then worked for the National Real Estate Investors Association. And um, that particular program, I, I happened to be at a home investors conference and sitting across from the expo for me was Home Depot. And so I ended up just walking over and starting a conversation and uh, that I got home and they wanted a, a, a media kit from us. And so I just put something together and sent it off to them. And that was the sort of the beginning of that relationship. And I, I think have, it's been oh nine or 10 when that happened. So about 14, 15 years. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I'm sure you've made tons of money off of that relationship that you built. You probably carved off a little bit of a, a spiff for yourself for that, right? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> it's I only wish. $2 billion in spending. Come on. Right. <laughs> yeah um 
it's 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 been incredibly helpful for the membership. Um, I, our membership has spent as much as fifty six million dollars in one year, and I think as little as thirty nine million um, since the program started with ICOR. That's amazing. And I, I mean, I don't think that many RIAs out there can really quantify exactly what they're doing, but from that one metric alone, I mean, I'm, at bare minimum, you're putting what, 30,000 into a property, bare minimum. And that that comes down to roughly, you know, 1,000 to 1,100 transactions from, from that one metric alone, which I think is impressive, impressive. Oh, I think it's extremely impressive that you know that has helped so many people save money on the things that they're doing for their rehabs and for their uh, fix and flips or just improving their rental properties like you've literally had a hand in saving people millions of dollars it's really cool yeah so what are if if anybody's thinking about joining a RIA, like what are some of the benefits they can get cuz i know you you run your rio different than others right obviously you're part of national RIA, but you know, when people come in, they have to think about, okay, there's like this, you know, code of ethics and then there's, you know, there's training and networking and you do stuff online and offline. And you got this really cool, uh, what's the the true North planner that you created? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, very unique model that you've built there. If, if people are thinking about choosing a RIA, just, just in general first, what should they look for? And then let's talk about what's unique about i -Corp. Well, um, I mean, early on, you had talked about, you know, uh, the, the the pandemic sort of shifted everything, everything sort of changed. Uh, the way that we participated in, in these types of meetings changed for a, a short while. But I, traditionally, I think most RIAs have, you know, their monthly meeting. And that's where everybody gathers and you generally have a presenter that's talking about something that's currently happening in the marketplace or a panel discussion or or, or a, a selling educator. Um, and then uh, outside of that, if it's a good RIA, they've probably got some workshops lined up for you um, on the weekend. Uh, maybe they've got a couple of webinars scattered throughout the, the, uh, the calendar as well. But I, my friend Chris calls it madhouse disease. And I think unless you truly know what you're trying to accomplish, which is why we created the True North Planner, but unless you truly know what you're trying to accomplish, you're just going to arbitrarily just keep absorbing more and more and more information and do absolutely nothing with it. Mm. So one, uh, my friend Alan came from IBM, the corporate world, and he talked about there is horizontal education and that's understanding how the whole industry as a whole works and then there's your vertical education and that's when you focus on one investing strategy and you go deep into that and before you go deep into that you sort of know i have to know all the pieces all the players all the strategies and how they intertwine and then you go deep and once you understand what you're trying to accomplish then you can start working on both of those two education models and I will say, and I've said it before, <laughs> multiple times on here, is like not all RIAs are created equal. I jokingly said, you know, uh, you know, most RIAs didn't make it into the 21st century. And here we are a quarter of a century in, and they're still not there. And technology has just taken off. Um, and there's, there's so much information out there, um, good and bad. Um, but again, I think not only understanding what your investing strategy is, but understanding who you gravitate to, who, who, without the sizzle of it, who resonates well with you as a, an investor. I think Tony Robbins calls it mirroring and modeling. If you're going to bake a cake, mm. go find the exact recipe and repeat it. Right. And, and that, so do you think they look to like the, the main organizer, the leaders of that group as sort of like, okay, this is, because like the culture kind of rolls down, right? Like once they set the culture and they've set kind of like, these are the standards of this club, then that's who they attract, right? So is that a good way to do it is to look at the leaders to see if that's somebody you resonate with or other people in the community? Um, yeah, well, I I always say that I-Corps is like Switzerland 
and that we're in the middle and we're just help facilitating this conversation and we're finding the subject matter experts and finding uh, the successful people out there that we feel that we should put in front of you that you can learn from. Um, you know, I think, uh, well, not to get in a whole tangent on partnerships and joint ventures, but I think, again, one of the reasons that RIAs were so successful is that you could go there and potentially earn some sweat equity in a deal with somebody and learn from what they're doing. I mean, I, the founders of i all had two different mentors that they that taught them everything. And then once they were standing on their own two feet, then they went out and pursued some of this higher price pointed education and invested in their education and in their business uh, to help them diversify or uh, increase their rate and pace of transactions. Mm -hmm. So again, so if someone's looking to join ARIA, like what should they look for and what should they be cautious of? Um, gosh, <laughs> it's a loaded question. <laughs> it is, but it's, it's one of those things too, where people can get sucked in because, you know, when there's community, you have common think, right. And then next thing you know, you're, you're one, you know, small cup of juice away from end up dead in some <laughs> village, right? Well, like, I, you know, t the first and foremost is if it sounds too good to be true, chances are it is. Right. Um, you know, and I think that when you hear these statistics about X amount per deal or how quickly they built up, those may be isolated incidents. Um, and to me, slow and steady wins the race. Um, I like to use the example of from Moneyball. It's like when uh, Brad Pitt's character is building that team for the uh, Oakland A's, they're all focused on runs and he's just focused on getting on base. And once you focus on a base hit, you get really, you get better at hitting base hits and those score runs right. rather than always cranking for the fence and wearing yourself out and getting uh, burnt out uh, before you even began. Hmm. Um, but back to your questions. <laughs> um, I, again, I think integrity is important. Um, and I don't know exactly how you find out someone's integrity. Um, it just, it, it takes time to sort of see how they operate. Uh, you had mentioned uh, our ethics policy. Uh, I have put that out there and it's been self-governing the my entire 12 years, 12? 14 years. I don't know. It's been a while, but all my entire time at i -Corps, I've had less than a handful of instances where I had to exercise that ethics policy. And uh, it's all sort of been self-governing. And if somebody is worth their weight in gold, somebody can vouch for them. And so just asking people, what yeah. do you think about this? Have you done anything with them? Have you heard about anything? Just asking questions. Uh, and my friend, Jeff Watson, uh, what does he like to say? He's like, uh, if we're good enough friends to have a contract, we're good enough friends not to have, or when, if we're good enough friends not to have a contract, we're good enough friends to have a contract. And right. it's the same thing is like, if we're going to do business together, you know, you got to be willing to sort of open up your uh, kimono, if you will, and and sort of bear all and and develop that trust at least early on. Yeah. Yeah, everybody puts their best foot forward when business first starts, right? And you're trying to like gain interest and, and build those relationships. But people's true colors come out when there's money involved and when things go sideways. And that's so that's people start to be protective of themselves and their own families. And like, you know what? We got to protect ourselves. And that doesn't always lead to um, the best decisions. That's That's the beauty of a good downturn is when the water goes out, you see who's standing there with the shorts down. Right. It's very true. So you've been run running this organization for a long time. Um, and, you know, there's been a big shift from in-person to, you know, to virtual. Um, what do you think is, is important about that? You know, are you still a big proponent of in-person meetings or a hybrid with online too because of, you know, the, the movement after the zoom revolution um 
I think the biggest change for me is frequency. Mm. Um, traditionally, i has had monthly meetings in Denver, Colorado Springs, and Fort Collins. And obviously, the pandemic changed that. We, we quickly, quickly uh, jumped to virtual because so much was happening and we needed to make sure that people were getting accurate information um, during that those first few weeks of uncertainty. Um, but then as we started to come back from virtual into in-person, uh, there was a huge influx of people that wanted to get in person, but there were still some people that didn't want to because of the uncertainty of the virus. But um, I think we got Zoom fatigue. <laughs> and so we can't rely wholly upon Zoom. You do have to give some sort of alternative to face-to-face, -face, but I think people don't necessarily want to come to monthly meetings or monthly events every single month. At least that's been my experience. And I, I can ask members and they'll tell me one thing, but their behavior tells me everything I need to know. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have begun to pivot towards larger quarterly events. Um, and it's it, it that has become our uh, watering hole. And so with everything that's changed in the marketplace, um, our first big event is coming up in a few weeks. And uh, I've really enjoyed building this event because it's been a research project for me because of all the things that are changing, the things that we talked about today, the co-living and the, the pivoting and, and you know adapting to what the market is yielding. Um, I had so many people that were sitting on the sidelines, not really engaging as investors or pursuing opportunities because they were uh, uncertain. So I think with these quarterly events, we'll be able to gather everybody together and accomplish in one day what we did in three or four months. And so uh, it, I think we'll be able to dig deeper into topics rather than going uh, just below the surface Mm -hmm. in the way that we have been at traditional monthly events. Um, I think for me, I've shifted to teaching people how to monetize off of information. And I think that we learn strategies, but we don't always look at the data points. We tend to be very emotional. And I think that's the one thing that they tell you is not to buy on emotion, and I don't think that we pay enough attention to the data and the metrics and the planning and development. All that stuff is being done for you by other big corporations or or the government, and we're not utilizing it. And so I want to, to teach people how to do that. So this event, it's, it's a convention style event. It's an all day event on the 21st, Saturday, the 21st. Um, there's still tickets available, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's going to be, there's going to be all kinds of speakers. You're going to have the convention experience. You know, you're going to have the vendors and, you know, the food and the opportunity to network and, you know, connect. I, 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 I don't like that word convention. <laughs> it's right in the title, R.E. Con. <laughs> that being said, uh, <laughs> it's sort of like Comic-Con. But it's the way that I have formatted this event, it's like it is like a watering hole. It's like a base camp. Yeah. And no matter where you are, what your your investing strategy is or where you are in your journey, the way that we've structured the event is to have a conversation uh, with subject matter experts. But we've done put people in round tables so that you have your little sub community where you can sit and digest this information. And we made it very specific to have two and a half to three hours of networking built into this event, because not only we're we going to share the information, but we hope that you can connect with other attendees. Uh, we'll have color coded badges or uh, wristbands so that you can identify whoever's doing what you're doing so that you can quickly connect with and have this conversation to see what other people are doing and what this information that we presented looks like in real, real life. That's amazing. So how can people find out more about this and, uh, check out our econ, well, the Colorado our econ, uh, and then also too, how can they talk to you about you know Icor and uh, the True North North Planner? We didn't get into it too much, but 
really cool thing that you're working on. How can they find you? Uh, yeah, uh, the the website is uh, I C O Rockies I C O R O C K I E S dot com, or you can email me directly, Troy at I C O Rockies dot com. Amazing! So everybody should definitely check out Icor. Um, I've been in one way or another connected with this group for close to ten years now. Um, and Troy is definitely one of the people in the industry that you can trust. Um, they do it right over there. I've met so many good people at i So go check that out at icorockies.com. And um, the event's coming up soon. So like you guys should go check it out. Tickets are fairly inexpensive, but there's a lot of good value that you're going to find if you attend. Um, so thanks for uh, checking this out. And Troy, thanks for taking the time. And I really appreciate you uh, coming on and just talking about your history and, you know, the kind of, you know, the whole idea and concept of real estate investor associations. Um, it's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Benson, always good to have time with you. Awesome. All right, everybody, please like share and follow this channel and um, uh, check out next time when we bring on other really cool guests like Troy, who are entrepreneurs and real estate investors and business leaders and are just doing really cool things that you can get inspired from uh, and also learn some things that you can take and implement in your own business. So thanks for listening and we'll see you guys next time. That's a wrap on today's real estate revelations. Thank you for tuning into the REI Hacker Podcast. Remember, every property has a story and every deal is a lesson. Until next time, keep hacking the real estate world.